got no way I'm going There ain't, ain't got no way Ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord No there ain't, ain't got no way, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it. end of the day what we must understand is we have a commitment to let truth be known no matter what it takes no matter what it costs truth needs no defense it just needs to be said it just needs to be told and that's our responsibility so i see we have our guest with us in the background and I will not waste any time. I will now introduce him. And I know that Brother Dexter has that information that he will share with regards to maybe his photograph or his book that he can put up on either side of the screen as we look to introduce our guests live here on Breaking Out of Depression. So, as you can see, his picture is up there on the right-hand side. And you've been seeing the siege run across the scenes, the screen scene, overcoming fear and anxiety with Craig Merriweather. And he's live with us in the studio in the background. So let me tell you a bit about our guest. Craig Merriweather is a mindset coach and clinical hypnotherapist. He helps people to eliminate negative emotions and trauma so that they can reach their full potential. He has helped thousands eliminate test anxiety, and we're gonna talk a lot about that at large. Get rid of test anxiety, fears and phobias, change their limiting beliefs and increase their confidence with ACE Any Test. It is the most comprehensive course for test anxiety relief he is the author of the best-selling program, Depression 180, about which psychologist Dr. Steven Gojevich, clinical assistant professor of medicine at the Center for Integrative Medicine, University of Arizona says, Craig Merriweather's book for integrative medicine is the most comprehensive and user-friendly resource to help ourselves and loved ones struggling with depression he goes on to say he highly recommends it so without further ado let's introduce our guest live on this edition of breaking out of depression craig merriweather welcome how are you today andy i'm doing well i've been really looking forward to this discussion with you and uh so much to i mean just anxiety fear depression so much to uh to discuss and uh, so many ways this conversation can go, but I'm thrilled to be here and I appreciate your invitation. Well, we appreciate your desire to serve and to help us to create the necessary uh, quality of what we're looking to do with regards to helping people overcome depression and anxiety. We appreciate you and we thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. So let me get right to the heart of the matter, Craig. The first question, why do people get anxious and fearful around and about tests? And I mean, from any age bracket you could think about, from oh, yeah. the time you hear the term exam or tests, we get anxious, we get yeah. angsty. Why? There's a, a, a fear that we have uh, as humans, uh, a fear of judgment, a fear of failing. We don't want to do poorly. We want to be success. I think a lot of that has uh, been, been you know, programmed into us. You know, be a success. Get those uh, A's in class, A plus in class. And when we don't reach that goal, uh, then we feel bad about ourselves. We don't want to feel bad. We don't want to hurt. 
We don't want to be in pain, especially if maybe a bad grade on a test or, or a report, a paper uh, keeps us from, you know, not only passing the class, we may get in trouble at home. <laughs> and that, we don't like that. We don't want that. Subconscious mind is for you. It's not against you. And so it's trying to protect you. Now, when we feel that anxiety, the actual feeling state of anxiety or, or fear or anger, that's actually a warning signal that there's danger in your external environment. Something in your world is dangerous and threatening. Now, when somebody's in the in a building and pulls a fire alarm, you get the sirens are going off, the lights are going off, warning everybody in the building that there's danger you need to get to safety. Well, we also have a warning system in our bodies, but the warning is anxiety. The warning is uh, anger, is worry, is overwhelm, is fear. Your mind is trying to get your attention through the feelings, the sensations in your body. And that's why we feel maybe a little fearful and anxious of walking down the dark alley at midnight, even though it's a shortcut home. It'd save us some time. But we feel that anxiety, we feel that fear about walking down that unlit alleyway. You know, stay to the lighted streets. You know, stay to the crowded streets. It's safer. You know, uh, here um, in Arizona, out in the desert, we, uh, you know, there's rattlesnakes maybe on the trail. Well, you don't want to go towards a rattlesnake and, and pet the rattlesnake and make the rattlesnake your friend. You want to move away from the rattlesnake, the fight in the street. You want to move away from it, make yourself smaller. And right. part of that safety system is warning you that you are in danger. Now, the big problem is, is the mind can't tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. And this is most noticeable, let's say, when somebody's having a nightmare. Maybe you've had this experience, Andy, I'm sure maybe some of your listeners have, or at least maybe the chil your children have. It's the middle of the night and you're having this crazy, scary dream, but it's ridiculous. It's kind of stupid. It's silly because a gigantic cheeseburger and his two hot dog friends are chasing down the street, throwing coconuts at you. It's silly. It's not going to happen ever. But your mind thinks you're in serious danger, even deep sleep in the middle of the night. Your mind is looking at this situation and it sort of has that shoot first, ask questions later. Mm. It thinks you're in danger. So even in the middle of sleep, in the middle of the night, your brain will start creating that adrenaline and that cortisol, those hormones. And you probably, you know, Andy, have heard of the crazy stories of grandmothers lifting cars off of babies. That's yeah. adrenaline. Doing that. That's not coursing through your body. Your brain is creating molecules called neuropeptides. And these molecules, hundreds of millions of these molecules being dumped into your, your system, into your bloodstream yeah. to signal your body uh, with that emotion. So these are literal molecules of fear, molecules of anxiety now being dumped in your body. 300% more blood moving to the big muscles of your arms to fight. 300% more blood moving to big muscles of your legs to escape. It has to come from somewhere. So your the power of your immune system shutting down, the power of your... Uh, uh, digestive systems turning down all because in this nightmare you're being chased down the street by a cheeseburger your mind can't tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined so what's happening in your waking life here's this exam you have to take at the end of the week or maybe it's a pop quiz or or or, or not just you know like say a written test or a test on a computer what what if you're a musician or an actor and you you right. have an audition what if you have what if you're going to a job interview what if yeah. you have to give the presentation at the at the meeting, or uh, you got you got picked to give the keynote speech at the big conference in a couple of months? These are all tests where the fear of failure or the fear of being judged can get heightened because you know may, they may be high stakes. And so this fear of failure, this fear of of being judged, that's a threat to us. Is a real threat? Is a is a bodily threat? Are we going to get injured physically and have to be in the hospital? No. But our minds, not being able to tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined, something in our past may have been painful. Maybe in the sixth grade, we uh, got up in front of class to do the history report. And we, we stammered and we forgot what we were going to say. And we stumbled over our words and all our, our pictures were upside down. And the kids laughed and, and made fun, fun of you. And, you know, kids can be mean. And now you held that because that hurt. That was painful. That was embarrassing. That was really humiliating. The teacher's mad because now the kids are out of control because, you know. And now you associate maybe taking a test or being up in front of people as being dangerous. Mm -hmm. you, you took that history test uh, or that math test or whatever, and you got a really bad grade and you got in trouble with your parents and you couldn't yeah. go out with your friends that way because you're grounded and you had to study or whatever. You know, 
this is causing fear and hurt and pain and your body, your mind doesn't want to experience that. So here's a similar situation. Here's a test, even though you're 25 or you're 50 or you're 65 and, and retired. And now you want to start a career as a real estate agent. You haven't taken a test in 45 years, hmm. but you know, now you want to become a real estate agent uh, into your sixties. Now you got to take a test. What is that going to, how is that going to make you feel? Right. And so in terms of the anxiety, it's warning. It literally is a warning signal that there's danger. Uh, in your world. Now, is that a real danger? Not really. But somewhere in your past, you you got hurt, or you mm. got embarrassed, yeah. or uh, humiliated, or got in trouble at home, or trouble at school, or maybe, you know, failed the class, or, um, or uh, got held back a grade, or had to take summer school, or something. You equate taking a test with, with pain, with hurt. Oh, yeah. And so not wanting to hurt again, your mind and body are going to warn you. And how's it going to warn you? with the, the uh, not the fire alarm, like in a building, but with the feeling states of anxiety and, and fear. And the unfortunate thing, what you practice, you get better at. You know, of right. course we know that if you le you're learning how to play guitar or piano, or you're um, learning dance or martial arts or foreign language, or learning to ride a bicycle or a little kid learning to walk, what you practice, you get better at. What's strong within your mind is what you do over and over again. And that's great. Again, when you're you know learning judo or karate or or dance or uh, a foreign language or or a musical instrument, well, what if you're practicing anxiety? What if you're practicing fear? Are you not just going to get better and better? You know, just like you can get a black belt in judo or taekwondo. What if you're you're training to get a black belt in anxiety and stress? Is it not just wow. not going to? and get better literally wow. wire that into your into your brains and so that's the insidiousness of this especially if it's starting you know back when you're a little kid you're in elementary school and um you know things aren't going well with the you know show and tell or the book report or something and then that uh, you get into high school and it goes even worse and let alone getting to college or university or going for the job interview or whatever what you practice you get better at but on the other hand that actually you can use that to your advantage you want more confidence, you want more strength and power in your life, you want more joy and happiness in your life. What well, if you're practicing that every day? You know, right. that just, you know, wire that into your system. So, you know, I don't think your mind or body are, are um, good or bad. It's just this, this is the way the system works. But if like any, like a computer system, you know, it's just a computer system. Mm -hmm. But put in, let's say you're writing, uh, Andy, like a, a um, accounting program for your business and you put in there two plus two equals five. Well, it doesn't matter how much you type on your keyboard or slam the keyboard with your fist out of frustration or talk to your friends or, or you know, talk to your counselor or take a Sharpie, take a, take a marker and write on your computer screen two plus two equals four. It's not until you go into that computer code and you look for the error. Oh, there it is. Two plus two. Two plus two equals five. That's odd. Well, you erase it, you amend it, you edit it, and then you write in two plus two equals four. Now press save, and all your equations equal out. Okay. And so, you know, it's it's not that the computer or that the software is inherently bad or good. It's just that instructions were put in there that it didn't work very well. So mm -hmm. change the instructions. You know, and, right. and you're allowed right. to do. That. You're allowed to do that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That was that was a ton load of information there, but I'm glad that you use it basically as your opening salvo to give us a clear understanding of why we find ourselves being anxious and sometimes really nervous, extremely nervous about situations, especially when we have to take a test or an exam, as the case might be. So, Craig, tell me this. When we think about controlling ourselves or having the opportunity or the desire to be at a more relaxed place in terms of our mind, what are some of the things that we can basically do to retrain ourselves to not succumb to the feeling of anxiety, the nervousness, but rather to go to a better place in our minds and focus on something that is more soothing, more yeah. positive, more affirmative, so that we remain in control despite the presence of some level of anxiety. Okay. 
This is good. Yeah, let's do this. I'll, I'll show you a, a quick little exercise you can do to reset your nervous system. So you turn off the, uh, the stress response. So this is a really simple, really easy exercise everybody can do. In fact, you can go out and teach your kids how to do this. You can teach your friends how to do this. This is how easy this is. The foundation of this uh, technique is with the breath. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's a little bit obnoxious, a little bit of cliched when somebody's really anxious, uh, they're afraid, they're, they're angry to tell them to take a deep breath. Yes, that's, that's, yes. That's pretty, that's pretty annoying when you're really anxious. Oh, just take a deep breath. That is literally the best thing you can do for yourself because mm. the breath is going to reset your system. But I'm not talking about a, a short, little shallow breath. I'm talking about way down into your lungs because the issue yeah. is, is when we're uh, in stress, in high anxiety and panic and fear, we're just breathing into the top part of our lungs. Now, if you take a moment, if, if it's safe to do so, don't take your hands off the steering wheel if you're listening to the car, but you know, feel where your ribs are. They're, they're like two inches from your hip bones. You know, your lungs are huge, but if you're only stress breathing, you may be only using maybe the top third of your lungs, so that very narrow part. So mm -hmm. you're losing out on nurturing and nourishing your body with oxygen. So uh, and the reason why is we uh, clench our stomach muscles. And this is a defense mechanism. The, the rib cage is here for your heart and lungs. That's what it's protecting. But the only thing protecting the vital organs of your abdomen, stomach, intestines, liver, kidneys, all that stuff, is the muscles. And so when you're right. stressed, you will tighten your muscles. It's waiting for that one, yeah. two punch to the gut. Mm -hmm. And you do this automatically. Uh, you know, watch a baby breathe. Babies breathe into their abdomens. And they need a lot of oxygen. Those tiny little lungs need so much oxygen because that's huge growth between day one and, and two, three years old. Right. Right around when we get into school, uh, you know, first grade, kindergarten. This is new. This is different. Where's mom? Where's dad? I don't know these people. This is a different environment. This is not what mm -hmm. I'm used to. You get stressed. You get a little bit anxious, maybe. The other kids maybe are, are thrilled. Here's all these new toys. Here are all these new people. Other kids may be really scared. And those scared kids are probably going to tighten up their stomach muscles. So pretty much by high school, a lot of kids are just upper chest breathing because they're yep. just so anxious and nervous all the time. Right. And again, the big problem is, is as a quick, you know, biology reminder, the blood, uh, your veins and arteries, it's delivering oxygen through your blood stream uh, to the cells of your body, to the muscles, to the tissues. Mm -hmm. While it's mm -hmm. doing that, it's you know, while it's delivering oxygen, it's picking up carbon dioxide, gases and toxins, flows all the way through to your lungs, it merges with your lungs, and you exhale out all that carbon dioxide, gases, toxins, trash, and garbage. <sighs> Breathe in all that oxygen, yeah. moves its blood stream and out, flows around, yeah. and all this over and over again. Well, yeah. through the top part of your lungs, only about uh, one uh, half a cup of blood is moving through the top part of your lungs every minute. Hmm. So half a cup of blood is being cleansed and cleaned of all that carbon dioxide and toxins and gases. Half a cup of blood is being oxygenated. Well, at the bottom of your lungs, one liter of blood. And that's huge. And let me reach out a frame real quick. Uh, I want to grab a, a little visual that I, I use with uh, clients when I'm doing hypnotherapy. I was realizing my window's open at a planes flying low overhead. So I apologize for everyone who's listening with headphones on. Um, you might hear a, a, a plane flying overhead. But this is a liter, a liter of Gatorade. But this yeah. is a liter. This is what you are not oxygenating if you're not breathing deeply, breathing into your abdomen and blowing up your abdomen, you know, like a, like a balloon. So you can get air into the bottom of your lungs, flatten out that diaphragm. Mm -hmm. This is a liter. This is... 60 of these an hour, or wow. this is a cup. Yes. So this is the difference between stress breathing and breathing deeply into your lungs. 20% of this, I don't know, that's probably 20%. 20% of this is going directly to your brain. Mm. Only if you're breathing wow. deeply. Imagine oxygenating your brain for calm, rational thinking. And so this is why I've taken a long time to kind of explain breathing. We all know how yeah. to breathe. Yes. Well, what if you were to really be mindful, really cognizant of how you're breathing, especially when you're anxious, when you're stressed, you'll find you're just upper chest breathing. Imagine if you could focus on your abdomen, 
release, you know, let go of those muscles, release them and blow them up. And sometimes that's even hard for us as, uh, as we get older, because, you know, we want to look good at the high school reunion. Yes. We want to look good at the wedding. We want our pants to fit better, you know, so we suck it in. It may take a moment or two, especially, you know, maybe later on tonight as, as a little exercise uh, when you're in a safe place and you can do this, lie down on the floor and just practice breathing into your belly. It, it's kind of an odd sensation if you haven't done it for a while. So this exercise, which was developed by Richard Nongard, is called three, two, one, reset. The three is three slow, easy, gentle breaths. So we know why. We want to get air into the bottom of your lungs. The other reason, really quickly, is that we have these nerves that come out of the back of our head, that test all parts of the body. It's that thing when you touch a hot pot, a signal goes up your nerve into your brain. It says you're touching a hot pot, let it go. It goes back down to your hand. You let go of the hot pot all within a millionth of a second. So we have the 10th cranial nerve is the vagus nerve. Vagus is Latin for wanderer. And so it yeah. attaches to your eyes, to your ears, to the muscles of your jaw, goes down past your vocal cords, attaches to your heart, to your lungs, and to your gut. The vagus nerve is a big part of the parasympathetic nervous system. That's the relaxation mm -hmm. response. You have the yes. stress response, the sympathetic nervous system. You have the relaxation response, the parasympathetic nervous system. The vagus nerve is a big part of the parasympath parasympathetic nervous system. It's attached to the lungs. When you breathe slowly, easily, deeply, and gently, you stimulate the vagus nerve and therefore activate the parasympathetic nervous system. How simple is this? This is not hard. It's just nobody's giving you the, the owner manual of your body. And so the breath, again, as obnoxious and as cliched and as annoying as it is to have somebody tell you to take a deep breath when you're anxious, it's literally the best thing you can be doing for yourself, filling your brain full of all that oxygen, all the nutrients it needs. So three, two, one, reset, three slow, gentle breaths. The two is we're gonna create bilateral stimulation. Now, when you're feeling anxious, whether it's a test or a job interview or just life, you know, business, uh, those emails you gotta return, the phone calls that are coming in, you know, family issues even, Yes. You're feeling that anxiety. It's lighting up a part of the right side of your brain. When you feel that panic, that fear, that anxiety, that anger, it's lighting up a part of the right side of the brain. It needs blood supply, oxygen, mm -hmm. nutrients to light up, yeah. to energize. So it's pulling it from these other parts of the brain. These other parts of the brain go quiet, they go, they go dark, and it lights up this one part of the uh, brain. Well, how do you want to do that? Well, you can just move your body. Right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. This might be backwards on the video. People mm -hmm. might be right in my head. Uh, left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Here's my little squeezy ball. You can do a racquetball, a tennis ball, a pen, uh, anything that's not breakable if you drop it. But, you know, for the audio people, if you're just listening to this, I'm, I'm out stretching my arms in, the, in like a T or a cross. And I'm going to pass the ball in front of me or a pen or water ball or whatever it is. And I'm going to just pass this ball in front of me back and forth, putting my arms back out and across. This is called bilateral stimulation. I have to light up different parts of my brain in order to make this movement. Mm. Where's that energy coming from? It's pulling it away from that anxiety, from that, that fear, that, that anger. And this is a, literally a way you can adjust your brain chemistry. Right. And, so you, and maybe you're familiar, Andy, or, or people listening, you may remember that kid in school or at the meeting the other day at work, uh, they were drumming on their knees. You know, they're, they're not hyper, they're not ADHD, they're, they're nervous. And yes. So they're sitting on their knees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yeah. self-soothing themselves. They're trying to make themselves feel better. And this is bilateral stimulation. Even feeling the tapping on your knees is bilateral stimulation. Walking down the street, across the house is bilateral stimulation. Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. You have to turn on different parts of your brain in order to do that. It needs oxygen, it needs blood supply, it needs fuel and nutrients. So it's gonna pull away from that anxiety. So bilateral stimulation, what we're gonna do specifically in this exercise, and if you're in a safe place uh, and you can do this exercise uh, with us, go ahead and do that. If you're driving a car or supervising the kids around the super, uh, swimming pool or whatever you're doing that needs your focus, continue that. Kind of eyeball clock where we are in the interview and then come back to this later on. But this is a great little exercise to do because we breathe in, three times really slowly, gently, closing your eyes only if it's safe for you right now. Closing your eyes, you can grab onto your shoulders. This is the bilateral stimulation we're gonna do. We're gonna grab our shoulders and make that cross with our arms. Now, of course, you're all gonna notice that this is a hug. 
This feels good. Even if you're giving it to yourself, this is nurturing, healing, loving touch. And you can, you know, just grab your shoulders, squeeze your shoulders, you can give yourself a bear hug. You, you can do the havening technique, which is rubbing your hands up and down your arms from your wrists back up to your shoulders. Mm -hmm. It feels good. This is nurturing, loving touch. You're now sending the signal from your body back up to your brain, and your brain is now changing the chemistry, mm. turning off the adrenaline and cortisol, now turning on oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine, the neuropeptides of love, joy, happiness, and deep connection. While you're giving yourself this hug, let's do that pretend mode. Remember the nightmare? No matter how silly, how ridiculous the nightmare, it'll change your physiology. Well, let's use that to our advantage, but what, let's flip it. Let's do the 180 of that. Wow. And now let's think of somebody you want to give a hug to. Maybe that's somebody you're up today, a family member, a child. Maybe it's a dog, a, a pet of yours, a dog, a cat. Maybe it's a good friend of yours, whether they live you know, across town, across the country, across the world. Maybe it's somebody who's no longer with us, your grandmother, your grandfather. Maybe somebody you've never met before, you know, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, you know. Martin Luther King, who, who is it that inspires you that you would just love to give a hug to? And pretend you're giving your, 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 this person you admire, this person you care for, this person you love a hug. And because you're sending the signal from your body back up to the brain with this real hug, even though you're giving it to yourself, you're imagining lighting up the visual part of the brain with that person or, or the animal that, that you care for. You're lighting up the visual part of your brain with this person or animal that you care for, pretending you're hugging them while feeling the hug. You're literally hacking your entire system. You're hacking your nervous system. You're hacking your brain. You are turning off the stress response, the sympathetic nervous system, turning on the parasympathetic, the relaxation response, and literally changing the chemistry within your brain. You're hacking your brain. And this you can do in just five minutes. You know, if you want, you do it for 15 minutes. There's no, you can't overdose on feeling joyful and happy and, and love. Yeah. If you only have five minutes, what if you were to do this exercise? And that's it. That's it. Wow. Three, two, yes, so yes, deep, yes. Deeply hug yourself. Think of somebody you want to give a hug to. Five, six minutes. You can teach a child how to do that. Yeah. Imagine teaching your five-year-old or your six-year-old or a teenager, if they're willing to listen to this and do this, this exercise, imagine giving them the power to change to reset their nervous system and change their own brain chemistry. Uh, you can do this right before a test. You can, you know, you know and be safe, be delicate, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, do it in, like in the bathroom, mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. an empty classroom, yeah. sit in your car before you walk into the, the class or a test, or if you're at home. So a lot of tests, you know, you do it at home over the computer. You know, put yourself in state. And that's the thing I don't think a lot of us think about is uh, putting ourselves in the state we need to be in. We think, oh, that's a musician does that before they walk out on stage or, or an actor or, or an athlete, you know, before they walk up to the starting line or, or, uh, or uh, you know, if they're a gymnast, you know, they're doing gymnastics, they walk, walk up to the mats or the parallel bars. They put themselves in the zone. They put themselves in state. Well, what if you're taking a test? What if you're a job interview? What if you, what if you have to give the presentation at the big meeting next week? Put yourself in state like an actor would. You know, um, one of the great actors of our time, uh, Ian McKellen, was just in London uh, recently doing King Lear. And he's one of the greats. This guy's been acting for some 60 years. Hmm. I guarantee you, he was putting himself in state to play the role of King Lear every night. Yeah. You know, it, it just doesn't end because you attain a, a level of mastery. We, we just... Uh, when we were recording this, uh, we just ended the Olympics, the Summer Olympics. I guarantee you every single athlete in the Olympics was putting themselves in state, putting themselves in the zone before they walked out to their event, whether it was solo or whether it was a group event like running or swimming or something. So what about doing that before you walk into your test, before you walk into the job interview, before you, you do the presentation or the audition if you're a musician or an actor? What if you put yourself in state? Um, uh, many, many of your listeners probably are, are into personal growth and, and personal development, obviously. Uh, th that's what you're, why your show is so great. It's like you go into so many facets, so many aspects of it. And so I'm sure some of your listeners know of Tony Robbins. Yeah. Uh, 
that guy, he's been doing this work for 40 years. He started in the early 1980s. You know, that big breakout book of his, Awaken the Giant Within, that came out in like the late 1980s, early 1990s. And there's a, a lot of you probably have seen may, or maybe heard about, he had that documentary about him, I'm Not Your Guru. I think it's on Netflix. And it's interesting if you like, th like that kind of thing, but it just follows him through one of those week-long events he does in an arena. He's talking to 10,000 people in an arena and you know he's motivating, he's inspiring. And these people pay three, $4,000 to yeah. be there yeah. a week. Yeah. And it shows up during the, the entire event, but you know, behind the scenes kind of stuff, backstage. But it also shows him uh, in his morning routine, he wakes up and, and this is what he does for him. This is what he feels he needs to do for him to be at his best. He does the cold plunge. He then jumps on a little trampoline to awaken his adrenal glands. Then he does his meditation yeah. work, what he does yeah. for him. Then he goes to work. You know, he goes to the event site. And he's talking mm -hmm. to the backstage people. He's talking to the, the people who are in the breakout groups, the small group leaders, he's talking to the event planners. He's talking to the lighting people. He's, you know, he's a father. He's talking to his kids on the phone. He's a husband. He's talking to his wife. He's talking to the producer about where they're going next, next year for next year's events. But then when he's about to walk out onto stage, he puts himself in stage. You get to see it in, in the movie. And he, I don't know, he kind of stands there and he spins around and pumps his fist in the air and he walks out to the exciting music. This guy's been doing it for 40 years. This is all he does. This is his mm. business, personal development, self-growth. Yeah. And he's still putting himself in state. He's one of the great orator oratorios. <laughs> it's not even a word. He's one, of the great <laughs> he's one of the great yeah. speakers of our time, one of the great presenters of our time. And yet, right before he walks out on stage, he puts himself in state because people want the Tony Robbins. They don't want Tony Robbins, the father, Tony Robbins, the husband. I'm sure that's a nice guy. Uh, Tony Robbins, who's t talking to as an accountant, uh, you know, nice guy probably, but I want to see the Tony Robbins. So just like mm -hmm. I don't want to see Ian McKellen, I want to see King Lear. And, right. you know, so he goes out there, uh, but, but before he does, he puts himself in state. Imagine putting yourself in state before the test. Imagine putting yourself in state before the job interview or the presentation to your investors, uh, you know, to expand your business or to the board of directors or you got tapped to give the keynote speech at the conference. Imagine putting yourself in state and then acing the test or, or acing the presentation or the speech. And you're allowed to do that. You don't have to be a famous actor or, or a, a, an extraordinary athlete or a masterful presenter like, like Tony Robbins. Just be you, yeah. but yeah. focus yeah. on what you need to do. What's the, what's the job at hand? The test, the interview, the, you know, being a father, being a mother after a hard day at work or in business, you know, hey, sometimes life is challenging. What about walking back into the house, being in state is like, okay, now I need to be a father. Now I need to be a mom. Now I need to be whoever you need to be. And putting yourself in state and putting away the, the you know, like me, I'm a hypnotherapist, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son to my parents. You know, I enjoy music. So I like listening to music, I play some music. These are all different aspects of me, but you know, if I've done a long, hard day's work as a hypnotherapist, helping people with trauma and, and horrible stuff that's gone on their lives, take a moment before I walk back in my house and engage with my son and, and my mm -hmm. wife. Uh, yeah. Don't bring that into the house. Let it go. Do whatever work you need to do yes. to let it go. Or, you know, uh, I spend all day with my son. It'd be really inappropriate for me to be the father mode and I do a hypnotherapy session or, you know, yeah. Uh, so put yourself in state. So the two things we went over to put yourself in state, that three to one reset exercise we just went over is a perfect way to do that. But it's also just, you know, focusing on what, what the task is at hand. And just like an actor going out on stage or an athlete uh, going up to the starting line or to the mat or whatever the thing is, or the, the event is, put yourself in the zone for what you need to be. And You'll, you'll notice extraordinary differences just with those two little uh, aspects of, of change within your life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So you have been listening to Craig Merriweather as he speaks about overcoming fear and anxiety, particularly putting yourself in the mode, in the space, beginning with the thought, the consciousness level of the role that you're going to play. And for many of us, like our producer and myself, 
we have to teach, we have to preach, we have to present that kind of thing. Sometimes a keynote speech, sometimes it's a workshop. And so we understand that before you go into that room, before you go in to meet the people, you have to have that presence of mind that brings you into a place where you control the fear, you control the anxiety. And then when you deliver, you deliver with confidence because you know that you have placed yourself in the right frame of mind. So we thank you, Craig. That was really tremendous value. So people, if you have questions or comments, please, anything that you don't understand, anything that you need clarity on, please put it up in the chat. We will respond accordingly. And now I would like Dexter to show us the thought of the week or the thought for the week. Seems as though he was anticipating me. <laughs> That's wonderful. In imagining what is best for ourselves, we must include what is best for others as well. Having the best is not being selfish. It's about sharing. So let me repeat the thought of the week or the thought for the week. In imagining what is best for ourselves, we must include what is best for others as well. That's your thought for the week. I want to put up also a video. And this one is change your words, change your words. And I know Craig will be familiar with it and he can do some commentary for us after. So if our producer could run that video for us, it's entitled, I entitle it rather, change your words so that we can get an idea of the mindset we really should have. There's this great quote by Here Bruce we go. Lee who once said, don't speak negatively about yourself, even as a joke. Your body doesn't know the difference. Words are energy and cast spells. That's why it's called spelling. Change the way you speak about yourself and you can change your life. What you're changing, you're also choosing. Now this goes back to the video about confirmation bias from a few days ago. What you're telling yourself over and over again is what you're programming into your subconscious mind. And as I said in that last video, your brain is processing 11 million bits of information every second. All the information that's coming through your five senses, but our conscious minds can only be aware of, of at most 50 bits of information a second out of that 11 million. So our brains filter out what it deems unnecessary and useless, including all the good stuff. So you have to learn to select your thoughts the same way you select your clothes every day. And that's a power you can cultivate. If you want your life to be better, then work on the mind and your self-talk. Because if you can master your thoughts and your self-talk, you can change your emotions. And if you change your emotions, you can change how you feel in your body and you can change your life. All There's right. This great quote by Bruce Lee who once said, don't speak negative. You're on it again, Dexter. <laughs> your body doesn't know the difference. I just want We're him uh, to comment on it to kind of elaborate on it. Yeah. Right. There you go. Yeah. 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 That's an extraordinary quote by, by Bruce Lee. And, you know, a, a guy who obviously, you know, martial arts master, but he knew the power of the mind. And if you're spending time during your day, bringing yourself down, insulting yourself, saying awful things about yourself, uh, you know, even just like you're, you're going through your day, you're at work, oh, I'm so stupid. Why did I do that again? Ah, oh, I can't believe I can never get this right. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's so stupid that I'm like this. You know, if you keep bragging ourselves, you never say that to a child. You never say that to your friend, but you say it to yourself. But those have ramifications. If you have your own voice telling you that you're not good enough, that you're not smart enough. You know, that, that's as, as bad as having your parents say that to you. And so the, the why I like that, that Bruce Lee quote, why it's so powerful, is you have the ability to take control of that voice in your head. Sometimes it's hard, especially again, if you've been practicing and maybe you've been practicing a long time, but you have the ability to take control of that voice in your head. And if it gets overwhelming, if it gets too loud, how do you turn it off? Here's a great way. Three, two, one, reset. You know, focus on somebody you care for. And that will change your thought processes, change the chemistry in your brain. So that's a great way to turn off any sort of uh, loud, negative uh, talk you may be giving to yourself. 
but you're allowed to choose your thoughts. Like, like at the end of that, you're allowed to choose your thoughts. Like you're, you know, choosing the coat you're going to wear outside the house. And, but you have to take that power. You, you have to, you can't, and nobody can do it for you. You can read all the books. You can look at all the videos. You can go to all the workshops, but you're going to have to take responsibility for the thoughts in your own head, what the, the self-talk you have for yourself. And, and you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to, to take care of yourself in a way that is, that is compassionate. You're allowed to have patience with yourself. You're, you're allowed to love yourself. There may need to be work around that. Mm -hmm. We have all these great modalities where it's, you know, some form of talk therapy or, you know, neuro linguistic programming or cognitive behavioral therapy or hypnotherapy or something. There's lots of great modalities out there to help, help you if you encounter trauma yeah and stress and, and anxiety and anger but it's really up to you right you, know, you need to take responsibility for the messages that are coming into your head and especially the messages that you're telling yourself and if you notice those negative thinking patterns i'm so stupid i, I can't do anything right uh, i can't believe you know i don't think anybody's ever going to love me if you're noticing that you need to change those and you need to change them post haste as quickly as possible because again what is strongest within your mind is what you do over and over again so if yeah. you're literally practicing self-hate mm -hmm. anger and anxiety towards yourself uh, yeah how's that how's that gonna move <laughs> you forward in life you know yeah you know, it's the whole thing that um you know how can you love anybody else if you can't love yourself right 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 yeah yeah, yeah i think playing that I've, I've kind of forgot about that but uh, that's a you know, extraordinary quote by Bruce Lee, and um, you really got to be careful about the messages you're sending to yourself. You yep. wouldn't say it to a child. Don't yep. say it to yeah. True, true, so mm -hmm. true. Uh, I totally understand that, and I, I agree with that 100%. 110 percent. I yeah. support that immensely. Now, Craig, you work with people who have experienced chronic anxiety, PTSD, cancer. Yeah. Is there any levels of differences between the level of trauma that these people go through? And if so, how do you differentiate it with regards <laughs> to the treatment that you would recommend or practice with them to overcome these high levels of anxiety? Yeah, um, cer certainly people out there, maybe people listening, have gone through some extraordinary trauma in their lives, maybe as, as a child. You know, extraordinary hurt and pain, abuse, and you know, I, I don't want to say this person's pain is greater than some other person's pain. If you're hurting, yes. you're you're yes. hurting. Yes. And whether that's a, a physical issue, like you know, uh, some illness, or it, it's a a mental hurt or pain, emotional hurt or pain, um, it, it's just the work that gets done in a hypnotherapy session is directed by the person looking for the healing. Because the person coming to a therapeutic hypnosis session, you know what the problem is. Now, that's not to say you consciously know what the problem is. And this is the difference between hypnotherapy and talk therapy. In talk therapy, you may just be talking about the issues of the day, the issues that happened a couple of years ago, or maybe even remember the issues that you had as a child. But it's through your conscious awareness, which may not be really understand the entire story or be able to access the entire story with the subconscious mind which is what we use in, in therapeutic hypnosis we quiet down that conscious mind so we can access subconscious and your subconscious mind knows what the problem is it may be hidden from you maybe in the unconscious but it knows because it's trying to protect you from it that's why you may feel hurt and pain and anxiety and stress in certain situations. You may trigger anxiety and anger and not even know why. Mm -hmm. You just might be all of a sudden you're at a, at a party and you hear somebody saying something or in the tone that it's being said. You don't know why you feel like that. Maybe you're in your, your office at work and the two people next door are raising their voices because they're arguing about the monthly accounting. Nothing to do with you. Just mm -hmm. they're way of being frustrated with each other that the numbers aren't adding up but their voices get raised and all of a sudden you feel really afraid and you you feel scared and you don't know why 
Well, maybe as a child, you had a household that wasn't very nurturing. Mm. And there's a lot of arguing in the home yeah. as you're yeah. growing up. You don't remember that. Maybe you're just like, yeah, <laughs> growing up with no, not so great, but now I'm enjoying life. I love life. I have a great family. But these two people next door in the next door office arguing about the monthly accounting triggers something within you because your subconscious mind is all, oh, when there's anger, yeah. when there's raised voices, that's dangerous and you need to hide. You need to make yourself small. Mm. And maybe that's the best thing you could have done when you were a child. Right. Keep yourself small to hide. Maybe that kept you safe. That was the best thing you could do. That's not going to work when you're an adult. Hmm. It's going to work in your 30s or 40s and, and while you're, you're running your business, you're, you're, you're working your career. And yet this, this, these raised voices triggered something within you. Maybe just like somebody who was in a car accident when they're 12 years old uh, with a red pickup truck, head on collision with a red pickup truck. And now they're driving down the street, they're 50 years old, clear, clear road, clear day, beautiful day, windows down, playing music is a wonderful day. Couldn't be a more stressless drive. And yet when you arrive at your destination, you're just anxious, you're gripping on the steering wheel. You don't know why as well. Well, maybe in your peripheral vision, you saw a red pickup truck parked in the grocery store. Ah. You know, it was not enough to like, hey, this red pickup truck's heading on, you know, a head on collision with the red. No, it was off to the side. But there's a file in your subconscious mind that red pickup trucks are dangerous. Mm -hmm. Not enough to like really warn you because it wasn't, it was parked, wasn't even running. Just as raised voices are dangerous and mm -hmm. you need to make yourself small to keep yourself safe. Okay, well, it's two accountants in the next room, but it still was enough to trigger a response, a warning signal, a warning signal of anxiety, a warning signal of fear. And so in terms of the healing work that needs to be done, there are a lot of different processes. And when, when I work with somebody, I have them fill out an intake form, they fill out online. And they may just write one word, anxiety. That's fine. Let's, we'll yeah. work on it. Or anger. They might just worry. I'm just angry all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all you want to say. That's fine. That's all we need to go on. You may write five paragraphs, uh, but we're here to heal what you want to heal. I'm not telling you, I don't know what you need to heal. You know, how long is it going to take? How many years is it going to take me to figure you out? And, and how many questions do I have to ask to finally realize, oh, the real issue is this and maybe still get it wrong. How many years is that going to take? So why don't we just let you heal you? Who better to know what the problem is than you? Then your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind is still trying to protect you from that issue. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to let it go. You're allowed to rechange it really, really quickly. Because I, um, I know we are, might be running up against time, but really quick, a really quick story of somebody I worked with. This is a, uh, I do a lot of my work over Zoom uh, nowadays. Oh, yeah. The COVID era is like a lot of therapists do nowadays. And that's nice because now I can, you know, I just have to work with people in my own city. I, I can work with people around the country, around the world, actually. And I was doing some classes for the Cancer Support Community of Arizona. Mm -hmm. Black State, Arizona. And, uh, you know, these are Zoom classes and 12, 15 people show up. And, it was, you know, we did a, a series of classes on pain control and healing acceleration and, and boosting your immune system, things like that. And this uh, older woman was uh, coming to the classes. I'd, I'd guess she's about 70 years old. And uh, she came to the first two classes. On the third class, I was you know, early to the Zoom room to set the uh, class up. And she came early. And so we were just started to chit chat, waiting for other people to show up and, and start the class. And she asked me if hypnotherapy works with procrastination. And yeah, you know, procrastination is a defense mechanism. Hey, you want to move away from the fire that's coming towards you. you. Want to move away from the fight in the street. You want to move away from the edge of the Grand Canyon or the, the rattlesnake in the trail, the bear coming at you. You want to move away from these these threats. But when it becomes unresourceful, now you're moving away from uh, turning in your homework or turning in the report uh, or uh, creating the PowerPoint presentation for your investors or board of directors. Things that could benefit you. Now now you're moving away from that, and and that's uh, not so good. So you're sensing danger there somewhere. So it's a mindset issue. You can certainly work with that with hypnotherapy. So we scheduled an appointment for the very next day. I had an afternoon appointment open. And so she comes to this, again, a Zoom session on her own, a solo session just for her. 
And she says, I know I told you I wanted to work on procrastination, but what I really want to work on is why I don't matter in life. This is Whoa. a seven year She doesn't matter. In life. What's wow. extraordinary about the mind is it's for you. Again, it's for you. It's for your, your, your safety, your protection, your survival. It wants you to win. And so instead of working on a problem, the, her subconscious mind decided she needed to work on the problem. And the problem was that she felt she didn't matter in life. And so right. there's a feeling state for that in the body. To feel that in your body, you have to change your brain chemistry, mm -hmm. you know, to feel that anxiety, that worthlessness, that, that fear. You have to cha change your hormones in your brain, creating adrenaline and cortisol. You have to create those neuropeptides, fear and anxiety, worthlessness. And so to change your brain chemistry in that way, in the way we're talking about, you can only do by having a thought or accessing a memory. So you know why you're doing it. You know why you feel like that because you're these thoughts and, and memories that are accessed, maybe even unconsciously, are changing your brain chemistry to make you feel like that in your body. So there's a connection. So in this a technique we, were, we used, uh, we went back to the very first time she ever felt being unworthy. Mm -hmm. it, didn't have any worth that she didn't matter in life. And so we're doing this process, this technique, and I count down 10 down to one. And by one, you're going to be at that very first time you ever felt that emotion. Uh, you felt that you didn't matter in life. 10 down to one and one, where are you? And she says, I'm standing up in my crib and my father's screaming at me because I won't stop crying. Wow. Now, this is, I don't know what standing up in a crib is. What is that, like 12 months old, 14 months old? That's a, that's you know, way before two years old. And so uh, this is somewhere around being a year old, uh, 14 months old. And, you know, if she's 70 years old-ish, I'm guessing, but if she's 70 years old, I'm guessing that's that's the late 1950s, early 1960s. And hey, men weren't taught how to nurture children. They didn't know how to do that kind of thing. Mm. back then. And maybe mom's out of the house and yeah. it's having a bad day, a bad week, a bad life. And just couldn't figure out how to get the baby to start crying. Didn't know what to do. Didn't know what the problem was. Mm. And at its end, the only thing he knows what to do is scream louder than the baby and tell the baby to shut up. Wow. And in that instant, that child needs to justify why this is happening. Here's this person who's supposed to love her, protect her, nurture her, mm -hmm. and screaming at her in rage. And how do you justify that as a child? Well, she justified it by deciding she didn't matter in life. That's wow. the only way that made any sense. Yeah. And she held on to that instruction in that computer code of her mind until one day she decided it was time to let it go. And mm -hmm. she did. She let it go. I never worked with her again. And she would email me for some months uh, over the course of the year. She would email me every few months or so. Doing fantastic, doing great. Because right. she knew what the problem was. And more importantly, she knew what to do about it. And using these techniques, she healed herself. Now, she probably didn't remember I mean, who remembers being one years old, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how long in talk therapy? And not to denigrate talk therapy, there's a lot of healing, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of help that can be used in, in having that second pair of eyes of talking to somebody, especially around relationships or business or mm -hmm. uh, hurt and pain you're feeling. But in terms of this work, how long was it going to take in talk therapy to get back to being one years old? Yeah. She yeah. knew what the problem was. And more importantly, because it was in that, that file in the subconscious mind. And she had that computer code on how to keep her safe. Keep yourself small. Keep your, you know, hide. You don't matter in life. So keep yourself safe by, by remaining small and unworthy. And maybe, again, that did keep her safe. Maybe dad wasn't the most nurturing person. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. The problems. Who knows? Hmm. But there came a point in her life where she had enough. And... Her subconscious mind, hey, here's this free class at the cancer support community. Yeah. It's all, I don't even have to leave my house. I wonder yeah. what this is all about. <laughs> the subconscious mind and just doing these general practices. Are, these are group practices, 12, 15 people for pain control, healing acceleration. Her mind says, I need to use this. Can you help with this issue of, uh, I don't know, procrastination? Sure, you can do that. And the next day is like, yeah, we got to do the big stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She told herself, I'm not going to fix anybody. Hypnotherapy in of, it, of itself is not going to fix anybody. You fix yourself. And right. That's what's extraordinary about you, you know, yeah. all of us. Yeah. You know what the problem is and you know what to do about it.
And yeah. so anyway, that was a hugely long answer to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, okay. it was a, it was a valuable a valuable connection to. Um, the question that I asked and also a practical situation that probably would help people to recognize that there can be things that the subconscious mind would lock away over years. In my, in my profession as a life coach, I have to deal with some of those things and people don't realize it. There was not healing, there was not closure, but it was something that they use as a protective mechanism for a situation that was traumatic to a certain level. And they did not have the skills the knowledge yeah. to manage themselves at that time. So they had to put up some line of defense mm -hmm. beyond the understanding of what they were actually going through. And later on, that continues to come. And, and you, you talk about seeing the red vehicle in the mirror and stuff, or hearing two people argue in the room next door. Those are trigger moments yeah. that hit the subconscious mind and it brings that back to memory. Those things are real people things that you have to deal with on a daily basis in life. So closure is important and understanding how to develop these coping skills and these coping abilities that Craig is an expert in makes a whole lot of difference. So we just have about uh, ooh, a few minutes to go, but there's a question that I wanted to ask you with regards to parenting, because I know you had the experience with your son and you spoke about the man who, in her imagination, well, it was her reality rather, during that period of time, could not have the understanding of what an amenable and amicable dad was supposed to be like. He thought screaming and telling the child to shut up in a loud voice was the thing to do because that's all he knew. And it's a sad thing. There are still people who are struggling with similar challenges, even in these times now. As parents, how would you advise them to deal with a child who are showing these signs of anxiety, especially for their exams? How can they help their child to reach to a place where they are understanding of the situation, but they're also able to help him cope or her yeah. cope better with that level of anxiety as far as exams or tests are concerned? I, I would firstly uh, ask if they know why they're feeling anxious, especially a little kid may actually yeah. remember the event. Yeah. Maybe getting into the teenage years, again, let's say this happened in the fifth grade about the history report or, or what have you. Uh, if, if the child's still young enough, they might, oh yeah, two years ago uh, in uh, Mrs. Wilson's class, uh, I got up to do that history report, that book report, that show and tell. And everybody laughed at me and uh, I don't like, you know, or I took the test and I didn't do very well. Maybe you're getting into high school, you might not remember so much, but in terms of helping children out, children are great at this work because they have great imaginations. Right. A lot of this work is just plain pretend and kids are great at playing pretend. They really get into it. And so, a great option for people, a parent, if your child is feeling anxious, have them close their eyes and ask them where they feel the anxiety. They will point and have them point to it too. Uh -huh. Where you feel it, if you can feel it, you can reveal it. If you reveal it, you can heal it. And so ask them where, and if you're an adult, this this goes, this isn't just for children. If you're an adult, you can do the same. But if you're, at, you're talking to your parent, talking to your child, and they're struggling with anxiety, ask them where they feel. Close your eyes. Where do you feel that anxiety? Right here in my chest, right here in my gut, maybe the back of the head, wherever they're feeling it. Maybe they bunch up their fists. I feel it in my fists. Where they feel it is the right way for them to be feeling it. And say, all right, tell me a little bit about is what color is that anxiety? Because now you want to start our brain in different parts of the brain. You want to, want to add color to it? Okay, now you kind of start using the visual parts of the brain and de-emotionalizing it and de disassociating from the feeling state. What color is it? Is it big? Is it small, rough, smooth, heavy? Does it feel light? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Does it look like a, maybe they say that it's the color red. Well, what does it look like? Maybe it's a, it looks like a spiky red ball or maybe a red cloud or it doesn't matter if it's a red cloud. It, it, have a look whatever it was. Their subconscious mind manifesting that anxiety in visual form. And then say, I want you to feel your feet on the floor and pretend that coming up from the core of the earth, from the middle of the earth, 
is a large vacuum hose, a large vacuum tube, and it connects to the bottom of your feet. And I want you to just vacuum out all that anxiety from your chest or your gut or your head or wherever you're feeling it. I want you to vacuum it out and just have all that red energy or that, you know, that, you know, yellow cloud or whatever it is. I want you to vacuum it all out down the center of your earth. Let the earth do it for you. You don't have to do anything. Don't even manage it. Don't worry about uh, making it go faster. Just let the earth vacuum it all out. And once it's all vacuumed out, great. I want you to bring into your imagination a picture of something wonderful, something positive. What's that picture? And maybe they say a rainbow or horses or mountains or their their best friend or their, their dog, their cat, whatever it is. They'll come up with a, a beautiful image. Now, I want you to take that image, grab that image and put it into your heart or put it into your gut, put it into wherever the stress was and fill yourself up with that. And that's a simple little exercise, again, that, that you know, if you can remember the, and maybe, you know, clock where we are in the interview and, and, and rewind to this part again and write it down, you know, just ask your child where they feel that anxiety. And, you know, especially if they, you know, ask them if they know what, it, what it's referring to. Maybe, again, there's that, that test they took in the fourth grade, the spelling test, and they didn't do very well or, the show and tell didn't go well, whatever the situation is. But if they don't, it doesn't matter too. It just might be interesting to know so you can talk about it. But ask them what, what that anxiety feels like. What does it look like? Big, small, rough, smooth, heavy, light, something else. What is it? What color is it? And, and then vacuum it out because they can do that in class. They can be sitting at the test for the test. They can, whatever the, the situation is. They can feel their feet on the floor. And if they were, oh yeah, I'm feeling a little anxious about this pop quiz, this math pop quiz that's coming up right now. And they're feeling anxious about it. Feel your feet on the floor and just vacuum it out. And that's a simple little thing you can work work with your kids with. Kids are great at this stuff. They're yeah. really good at stuff. Adults are good at it too. But kids are maybe even better at it because they have that that innocent imagination that they just, oh, okay, yeah. Let's, let's me and my best friend pretend we're were uh, grizzly bears out in in, in uh, Yosemite, you know, and you live in New York City or something. You know, kids are great at imagination. And so uh, use that to your advantage. You know, if they're feeling anxious, ask them why they feel they are anxious. Mm -hmm. And maybe if they say you don't know, that's great. That's fine. Right, Where right. You feel it, what does it look like? Take it out. Yes. Even if you have to, like, grab it out. And if they don't, <laughs> I don't want to grab it out. Okay, I'll. can I do it for you? Yes. Yeah. You, you grab their, your, you may be feeling it, and they, okay, I'm pulling it out. All that, great. You let me know when it's done. Hmm. You know, I, I, I do this work with adults. Right. And I, I if they if they're struggle with trauma, they struggle with anxiety, struggle with anger, where do you feel it? And I want you to pull it out, literally. Pull it, well, not literally, but you know what I mean. Metaphorically, pull it out. I don't say yes, yes. Pull it out. Yeah. Ed, I, I'm, not, I'm not joking, Andy. I've had people pull their trauma out for half an hour, 30 wow. minutes, pull, 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 because the subconscious mind is going to give you the image or the color or the feeling state or whatever it is in the way you need to. And if it's doing it, then it's been marked and designated for removal. It's your subconscious mind ready to heal. What color is it? Where do you feel it? You know, zero to 10. How, what, what level is it at? No, it's a, it's a nine, nine and a half. Okay. I want you to pull it out. You'll pull and pull and pull and pull and pull <laughs> until it's all gone. And I've wow. literally had people pull for half an hour, 30 minutes. Amazing. And, yeah. 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 Oh. Wow. On, on that note, we have come to the end of this amazing episode with regards to overcoming fear and anxiety with Craig Merriweather. And I just want to put up the thought of the week one more time before we depart the thought for the week. And we're going to bring this episode to an end. There it is, thought for the week. In imagining what is best for ourselves, we must include what is best for others as well. So this is your brother in Christ and your supporter, Andy Charles, with Brother Dexter Honorary in the background, and our guest, Craig Merriweather, on this episode of Breaking Out of Depression. As we leave you, remember that you have the opportunity, you have the ability, you have the strength in your mind to think positive, to do positive, 
and to overcome all levels of fear and anxiety. You have the spiritual aspect of it. You have the scientific aspect of it. You have the emotional aspect of it. If you take care of every part of them as you go along the way, then holistically you have a much more better balanced life because it leaves less room for ignorance, meaning not knowing what you're going through, understanding it and knowing how to actually deal with it. So we thank our guest, Craig Merriweather, for staying with us and for sharing his expertise and his experience with regards to dealing with fear and anxiety, particularly from young adults, teens, and also parents, adults dealing with their children with regards to test and exams anxiety. So, uh, Craig, stick around with us for a moment. Our producer might have a question or two for you, but we have now come to the end of this program. And as I always say, as I leave you, in all that you're doing, do all that you can to keep breaking out of depression. We love you. God bless. Thank you for your commitment and your continued support. Bye for now. Stay safe. There ain't got no way, ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord, no Ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord, no Ain't got no way I'm gonna make it without my Lord, no Ain't got no way I'm gonna make it